got to announce that the new today devotionals are on the back table. Please take a couple, pass them out, or share them with someone. We've been studying, for the past couple of weeks, we've been studying the various feasts of the Lord that um, God gave to the Israelite nation uh, way back when they were wandering in the wilderness when they first left Egypt. And today is the Feast of the First Fruits. So I was wondering, you know, I do this sometimes. <clears throat> Did you ever wonder about the agricultural process of planting, cultivating, and harvest? We've got gardeners and, and farmers in here. Did you ever stop to think about that cycle and why does it take so long and the, the timing and all that? Did you ever wonder why God designed the seeds with a specific time to sprout and grow into a mature plant. I mean, wouldn't it be easier if we planted a seed and it grew up immediately? So we wouldn't have to wait for weeks or months in order to eat the food. Well, there is a divine reason for the agricultural cycle of seed time and harvest, and it's closely tied with the feasts of the Lord. Leviticus chapter 23 describes the seven feasts of the Lord, or also known as the appointed times of the Lord. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 23. I know Leviticus 23 is not a usual Easter morning <coughs> scriptural passage, but you'll get it. Before this okay, next half hour is out. Page 120. Le okay. Leviticus 23, starting at verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, now in the beginning of the chapter, he, uh, the Lord described to them the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, in verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after Sabbath. Do we know when the Sabbath is? Saturday. Sabbath is always Saturday. It's never Sunday. Sunday is the Lord's Day. So this is going to be, this is to be done on the day after Sabbath. On the day you weigh the sheaf, you must sacrifice as a burnt offering to the Lord a lamb, a year old, without defect together with its grain offering of two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made to the Lord by fire, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering of a quarter hen of wine. You must not eat any bread or roasted or new grain until the very day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. <clears throat> so, the Israelites, as you read that chapter at the from the beginning, you'll see that the Israelites which begin observing the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread immediately while they were there in the wilderness. But the feasts of the Feast of First Fruit and also of Pentecost would have to wait until they were in the land that God had promised them. 
The Feast of First Fruits is observed in conjunction with the barley harvest season of Israel. It is celebrated the day after the Sabbath that occurs during the week of unleavened bread. Now, we've been studying this for the past few weeks. On the 14th day of the first month of the year is the, the, the Passover feast. The very next day starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that goes for seven days. On the Sabbath day during that week, whatever day, because Passover is going to fall on different days, on the, pass, on the Sabbath day, the very next day, is the Feast of First Fruits. Passover is determined by the full moon. And I get mixed up when we talk about astronomical things and moons and all that. So I'm not going to sort all that out, but it's a different date every year. And that's because the Jewish people have a different calendar than the Western world. So that's why. <laughs> so anyway, so this year, Passover was this, was this past Monday. Monday. Which means that unleavened bread was Tuesday. Yesterday was the Sabbath day of the Passover. <coughs> so today is the Feast of First Fruits. Feast of First Fruits always falls on a Sunday because it's the day after Sabbath. On this feast day, the Israelites brought the first portion of their barley harvest to the temple as an offering to the Lord. Barley was the first spring crop. So this symbolic and sacrificial act was a demonstration of faith that God would give them a bountiful harvest for the rest of the year. And by offering the first fruits of his harvest to the Lord, the farmer acknowledged his total dependence on God. Now God promised them a harvest, but the Hebrews still had to wait for the yield. They had to stretch their faith on the one hand and trust in God's faithfulness on the other. Now doesn't that sound like our own experiences with the Lord? He promises that he will provide, yet we must do our part. Then we wait on his timing for the fruition of the promise, during which time we keep reminding ourselves and each other to keep trusting God. Don't give up your faith. Keep up your faith in God. For every harvest in Israel, there are three phases. First fruits general harvest and gleanings. First fruits also has three phases, the marking, the gathering, and the presenting. The marking refers to identifying the first <coughs> maturing patch of barley, which is to be bound in a sheaf. And they usually use a red cord to bind it so that it's real easy to spot out in the field. When that sheaf of barley is ripe, it's brought to the priest to be presented or waved before the Lord at the altar. Uh, verses 11 and 12 that I read, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land, which I am going to give to you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now listen to this. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 23 says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection from, of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, 
after that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Remember that this uh, waving of the sheaf was done on the first day of the week. Let's look at Luke 24. thereby fulfilling this feast. One of the ways that the Feast of First Fruits symbolizes spiritual harvest is to represent both Jewish believers and Gentile believers during the church age. We live in the church age right now. The church age is that time from when Jesus ascended to heaven all the way up, it goes all the way up to whenever Jesus is going to come back for us. Romans chapter 8 verse 23 says, We ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And James 1.18 says, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. The order of harvests in Israel parallels the order of the resurrection of believers. The barley harvest is in the early spring. The barley kernels are winnowed by being tossed into the wind to separate the kernels from the chaff. This is done because the head of barley is very soft and easily crushed. Like the birth of the church at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came like a wind and indwelt the believers, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, there came a noise like a violent rushing wind that filled the upper room where the disciples were all gathered. In the order of resurrections, the church is the first to be resurrected, and that's at the rapture. Just like the barley is the first to be harvested, it is as if the church is being winnowed out from the world. In the late spring, the wheat harvest begins. Since the head of the wheat is hard, it must be threshed or crushed to separate the wheat from the chaff. A man who is threshing the wheat stands on this large board. Underneath there are bits of glass or rock embedded in the bottom of this board. It's pulled by a horse over the wheat to crush the heads of grain. In Latin, this board is called a tribulum. Many people, including Jews, will come to Christ in the tribulation, as we see in Revelation chapter 7, uh, verses 9 through 14. And apparently, you can tell if a field is wheat or barley by the way that the stalk stands. Barley bends down as if it is bowing in humility, while wheat heads stand straight up. Can anybody verify that? I don't know. It's true? Okay. The church, which is represented by barley, will be resurrected first at the rapture, while tribulation saints will be resurrected later. In a sense, they will be harvested under the crushing of the tribulation. 
at the beginning of the fall season, the fruit harvest is underway. The grapes are picked and then placed in the wine presses. This is parallel to the judgment of Revelation 14, verses 18 through 20. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are white. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and the blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. So we have the first fruits, and then the general harvest, and then we have the gleaning. Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10 instructs the Jews not to harvest the corners of their fields and or their vineyards in order to leave grain and fruit for the poor. And this represents the believers that we read about Matthew 24, verse 31 who will be gathered at the end of the tribulation to enter the kingdom. Since they do not die, they, will, they won't be resurrected. Instead, they will move into the kingdom to populate it for the next thousand years. Now, what does all this have to do with the resurrection? Well, going back a few days, according to the instructions of the Passover meal, each family was to choose a lamb, take it into their home, and watch it carefully for any flaws. Then at twilight, they were to kill it. Jesus was the chosen lamb. The Son of God was taken into the home of Joseph and Mary and into the hearts of the common man of Israel. When he became well known for his teaching and good works, the religious leaders watched him carefully looking for a flaw, looking for a reason to trip him up with his own words, looking for a reason to arrest him. The Jewish families closely observed their lamb to make sure it had no imperfections that would disqualify it from being the sacrificial lamb. The Jews were hoping to find imperfections. They were hoping to find imperfections in Jesus that would disqualify him from the claims that he made to be the Son of God. Jesus was betrayed by a friend, like the lamb who was led to slaughter, by the father who had treated him so tenderly for several days. And about the time that Caiaphas was interrogating Jesus at his trial, the disciples of the Sanhedrin were in the barley field judging the crop to decide which patch would be ready for the first fruits wave offering. And when the Romans were binding him up for crucifixion, the Jews were binding up the barley sheaf for the offering. Then at the time that the Jewish fathers were leading the family lambs up the hill to the temple to be killed, Jesus was being led up the hill of Calvary to be stretched out on the cross where he died. Therefore, when Jesus cried out, it is finished, it was a declaration that he had been roasted in the fire of God's wrath and emerged on the other side. John chapter 20, verse 1, says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. This happened the day after the weekly Sabbath, Sunday, the day of the Feast of First Fruits. 
Then we go down to John 20, verses 11 and 12. Mary was standing outside the tomb and weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. Do we know what the mercy seat is? The judgment seat. Pardon? The judgment seat. The mercy seat. You may have an illustration of, in your Bible of the Ark of the Covenant. On the top of the Ark is a flat slab. That's, that's the lid. At either end of the Ark of the Covenant, is, it's basically a box, a rectangular box, specially made. Flat on the top, on either end of this, the lid, is an angel sitting, and the wings stretch forward, touching or almost touching each other. That flat space in between the angels is called the mercy seat, and it is an earthly depiction of the throne of God. The place where we find mercy on the basis of our faith in Jesus and his sacrificial blood. Well, as Mary looked into the tomb, she saw a flat space, a slab, with an angel at either end. It was a living display of the mercy seat. A couple minutes later, Mary saw Jesus, although she didn't recognize him at first. But when he spoke her name, she knew who he was, and she tried to hug him. But in verse 17, Jesus said, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, and to your Father, and to my God, and your God. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, the Jews could not touch the barley before the day of first fruits. Once the barley sheaf was presented to God by the priest, the barley crop could be harvested for use. Since Jesus was the first fruits, he had to go back to the Father and be presented and present himself before the heavenly altar before anyone could touch him. We see in verse 27, eight days later, that he had been to the Father and come back, for Thomas was able to touch him and verify that he wasn't a ghost, but that his body was indeed resurrected. Until they harvested and offered the barley sheep in the temple, the rest of the crops were not kosher meaning they were not lawfully fit or acceptable. First John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are now kosher, so to speak, because of what Christ has done on our behalf in fulfilling the feast of first fruits. The field of barley became kosher because of the offering of the first fruits. The barley in the field did not do anything to accomplish it, just as we are not made kosher by our own efforts, but because of Jesus who makes everything kosher or acceptable to anyone, acceptable to God, anyone who trusts in him. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for, um, for you. And as we learn more and more about um, what is in your word, the whole picture of eternity lays before us, the whole picture of what is going to happen throughout history and on into the future. You've already given it all to us in your word, represented in the feast days. We see how we become 
um, acceptable to you through the blood of the perfect Lamb. And we see that by his power, which raised him up, raised Jesus up out of the tomb, we see that we also, there's that promise, we know that we also will be raised up out of the grave to live forevermore with you. What a day, glorious day that will be. And we look forward to it, Lord. And I pray for those who do not know you. I ask, O oh Lord, that you would do a mighty and miraculous work in their hearts. I ask that you would touch them, O oh Lord. I pray that you would lovingly and gently show them how very much in need that they are in need of a Savior. How their sins are a great offense unto you. I know that sometimes our sins, they don't seem so bad to us, but we're not looking at them from your viewpoint. Whenever we uh, sin, it is an affront to a holy and perfect God. And we know that those who are sinful do not enter heaven. Lord, I pray for, that for those who do not know you as your Lord and Savior, and that you would open the eyes and ears of their understanding to see and to know how very much you love them, the great extent, the monumental sacrifice that was made on their behalf. And I pray, O oh Lord, that they would humble themselves like a stalk of barley, and call upon you for salvation this very day, in Jesus' name.